fucking really. Alright. I'm going to go again. Getting there, right? Cool, cool. I have a couple more papers graded to give back today. Not a lot of them. I, um, yesterday was kind of sick. I have a cold, not the coronavirus. My son gave me because he's almost a year old and just full of snot and whatnot and goes to daycare and just like, it's like a cold germ. So if I'm coughing, I'm not doing pages for COVID. I've been tested on the pages. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So we're going to finish up Souls and Neatson today and then we're going to do a uh, kind of mock up of the evidence sheet. So remember for the policy proposal, it's going to be the final project, right? We're going to start in the coming weeks doing an evidence sheet a week, um, which is just basically to get the sources and the MLA bibliography for your uh, final paper. And so this is kind of do like a, a trial run of it using the Souls and Neatson essay. So first thing I'm going to pass up before we can get started is an example from a Policy proposal evidence sheet from a student in a past semester from a past institution, i.e. not a UTPB student. So you can just see kind of what goes. Um, cool, that'll give an idea of what a well-completed one looks like. I have the blank ones we're going to use for the Solzhenitsyn thing. Come here, I'll pass them out after we finish the Solzhenitsyn article itself. So, I'm going from there. So this is just basically the one path. What's being passed on right now is just an example of a student who completed an evidence sheet for their final project properly. They got an A on the evidence sheet, so that's um, that's good. That's as good as you can get. All right. So we're back with Stolz and Nietzsche. Remember, we're talking about, or he was talking about last, right? The idea that the uh, intellectual development in the West has been kind of stymied by the fact that everybody is kind of an echo chamber, right? Like the people who are going to be teaching at universities or who are students in graduate programs, right, have to have the research approved by people who are already in the discipline. Because of that, kind of you get the same crap regurgitated over and over again. Any kind of new thought or anything that will actually change the system and actually help improve society, right, is kind of rejected because it rocks the boat too much, right? If you have a new idea that like controverts or contradicts what your like you know professor in graduate school thinks, right? It's probably not going to get passed and approved for your your dissertation and your thesis committee, right? Because of that, he says there's a lack of intellectual development or intellectual honesty or originality in Western um, or American institutional thought. All right. We want to read the yeah, without censorship here. It's a long paragraph, so someone with a lot of breath. Please, thank you. Thank you very much. Great job. So we think, we think All right. If you have like an original idea or something that kind of rocks a boat or goes against conventions and say, I don't know, you're silly enough to post it on Twitter or on Facebook. Or I don't know, you post ideas on Instagram or just like pictures of coffee and other stuff. Like food you get from a bougie restaurant. It's like, look at my asparagus. Right. 
what if you post something that's kind of like rocks the boat or, or like original thought on Twitter? Like you have a great idea about something. You're like, hey, here's what I think. What happens usually? Right. I mean, yeah, definitely, right? Because probably at least 50% or like 40% of people out there in the world who are on Twitter will disagree with you. It might be 40% who agree with you, right? If you're saying something really intelligent, maybe only 20% will understand you. But probably 50% of those will be against it and 50% for it, right? And so just because of the way that people are divided today, right, and the fact that like anybody who has like an original idea is going to piss some people off. Why? Because a lot of people are comfortable right now, right? Like in general, most of the people who are established in society, those people who are kind of either running the show or just comfortably like having their little house and their, you know, 401k or whatever, right? are pretty good with the way things are. And so there's no real incentive. In fact, there's a disincentive from trying to rock the boat and change that up, right? Like everybody's comfortable enough that, I mean, not everybody, but the people who are, like, are in charge largely, right, are comfortable enough they don't want anything to change. And because of that, right, you say something that will change things, right, people are going to be against that because it threatens their status quo, it threatens their way of life, it threatens their way of thinking about things, right? And so if you are somebody who has an independent idea and puts it out there, you're going to get backlash and feedback and backlash and negative feedback. Not only that, but, like, people who are, like, in charge of reporting stuff, like the media, like he says, right, are probably not going to cover it unless it fits their narrative one way or the other, right? So he's saying that even though there's intellectual freedom in America, you can say whatever you want, technically speaking, right? The amount of people that can actually reach, the amount of people that can actually affect and help change the minds of is very limited because it's limited by the amount of people who will cover that, right? If you don't say something that people are already saying that people want to hear as part of the narrative, people won't say it or won't repeat it, rather, right? I think that's as true today as it was in 1978. Um, all right. And so when he says here, the, the voices of 17 countries in Eastern Europe and Eastern Asia, what he's talking about is like the countries at that point in time, which are behind the Iron Curtain, right? Like um, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, Romania, right? Who are all like Soviet controlled occupied countries who had no free elections who were like, hey, yo, like we said we'd get free elections when they took us over and we didn't get free elections, like help us out. And everybody in the West is like, oh, they love the communist regime. It's just great. Don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about, right? So basically he's saying that there's like the whole half of the world that's being occupied by communist Russia at that point in time. is saying like, hey, we need help. This ain't cool. We're being starved. And the West is like, oh, no, it's good, right? They said they liked it. And so that's uh, what he's referring to there, right? It's actually funny. I had a, a friend of mine when I was at – so I went to – um when I was in the Marine Corps, the language school, Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, learning Arabic for 72 weeks. Um, I had a friend there who was actually Romanian. So he was Romanian born. Romanian was his first language. He learned English and then he was learning Arabic in English as like his third language. Crazy guy. Um, so he went to like our glorious comrades precinct number 1444 for like his um, grade school. So he was like behind, born behind the Iron Curtain, like in communist um, Romania and was like doing got communist stuff in grade school. I did like, you know, pledge allegiance to Stalin with their hand in the air, all crazy like and stuff. That's bizarre because it was in the 90s, right? Like when you think about the communist regime and Stalin, something that's like way old. This guy who's like my age, I know I'm old, I'm not that old, right? Was like behind the Iron Curtain learning like Russian history that was like totally fake about how great Russia is, how great comrade Stalin is, right? Um, in his grade school. And that was just crazy to me. Yeah. So it like it was happening very recently or well, Relatively speaking, very recently, huh? All right. It continues. I mentioned a few traits of Western life which surprise and shock a new rival to this world. Not like an alien, right, from outer space. He's like a new person coming to the West, right? All right. The purpose and scope of this speech will not allow me to continue such a review. To look to the influence of these Western characteristics on important aspects of a nation's life, such as elementary education, advanced education, and the humanities and art. It is almost universally recognized that the West shows all the world a way to successful economic development, even though in the past years it has been struggling, strong, it has been strongly disturbed by chaotic inflation. However, many people living in the West are dissatisfied with their own society. They despise it or accuse it of not being up to the level of maturity attained by mankind. A number of such critics turn to socialism, which is a false and dangerous current. Right, it's basically saying like, yeah, some stuff sucks. Like in the 70s, right, there was like Carter was in charge. There was inflation. There was like gas rationing that was going on. People were like, okay, like we can only sell gas to like people whose names are like A through H on Mondays and Wednesdays. And if like show your ID and get gas. It was kind of a crazy time too because of that. Like it's hard to imagine that going on now, right? Like you have to like, you can only show up to the gas station on like a Wednesday or a Monday and like freaking you have to show your ID that proves your last name starts with the right letter in order to get gas. But that was, that was a thing, right? Um, but he says, like, socialism is still not better than that. 
I hope that no one present will suspect me of offering my personal criticism of the Western system to present socialism as an alternative. Having experienced, having experienced applied socialism in a country where the alternative has been realized, I certainly will not speak for it. The well-known Soviet mathematician Saraf Sharafovich, a member of the Soviet Academy of Science, has written a brilliant book under the title Socialism. It is a profound analysis showing that socialism of any type and shade leads to a total destruction of the human spirit and to a leveling of the mankind into death. Sharapovich's book was published in France. Sharapovich's book was published in France almost two years ago, and so far no one has been found to refute it. It will shortly be published in the United States. It was like three years before it was published because nobody wanted to publish it in the United States. But basically what he's saying, and when he says socialism, he doesn't mean like Denmark or like Bernie Sanders, right? He's talking about like Soviet socialism, right? So the difference between like Soviet socialism or like Russian communism, right? And like the, so the socialism in like United States or in Denmark, right? Is like who controls the means of production, right? So in Russia, right? Stalin says, okay, you farmers, you're going to farm this much grain. You're going to give us all your grain to plant, right? right? You can only keep so much, right? In Denmark or whatever, in the United States even, like you're taxed a certain amount of money so we can fund social programs, right? So there's a level of socialism, right? Like public education, right? Like if, you, if you have a house, right? You pay a property tax on that. Or your parents pay a property tax on that. And that money goes to fund the education system in the school district that house is in, right? Like if you have a job, you get taxed um, a payroll tax and an income tax. So the federal government in the United States takes like ish 20%, depending on how much you make, all, all the money you would make and takes it as taxes off the top, right? And because of that, they can fund social programs like Medicaid, Medicare, like um, food stamps, like public education, right? And because of that, it's kind of socialized in that regard, right? But it's not socialized in the way that the communist Russia was socialized where like the ways of production, both people's labor as well as like what they produce by their labor are owned by the government entirely. And so that when he says socialism here, that's what he's talking about, right? He's not talking about like a Bernie Sanders socialism or like a Denmark, like Medicare for all socialism. It's a different kind of thing. But he's using the word interchangeably because up in this point in time, right, like socialism was communism back in the day. There was no differentiation, really. All right. So just to be clear on the terms we're talking about, right? All right. Someone will read, want to read, but should someone ask me whether? Again? All right. What does he mean by that? Why is our life sad? Like, what's the spiritual development in Russia that he says is going on? Intense spiritual development. What's he saying? I don't think everybody's like become monks, right? It's not living in a monastery chanting 24 7, right? I don't think that's what's going on in Russia. What does he mean? Yeah. You could be, but you're probably right. Right. Yeah, they don't got no Atari's, they don't got no TVs, no Xbox. They got like the communist radio station that plays whatever Stalin says over and over and over, right? And that's about it. Yeah, they have no free yeah, they no freedom and choice in how to live. They have no material success as such, right? They have no no Rolls Royces, no Chevrolets, no, you know. They don't they don't have much material wealth, right? What they have is a lot of suffering. And there's an argument here, right, is that through suffering through having to endure a bunch of hard times and, and the government messing with you and like the potentially getting killed for like saying something against Stalin, right? That there's a character that's somehow built because of that, right? Like not like a character in a cartoon strip, like some like personal character, like enduring hardship, right? Makes someone in his opinion, like a better person or a more thoroughly spiritually alive person. I don't think when he says spiritual alive, I don't think he means like religious per se, right? I think he means just like somebody who can like look at the world around them Right, and see something higher than themselves in it. Right, that the end of life, like the goal of life, is not to make myself happy. Right, it's you see the value of community, of making other people around you suffer less. Right, and so that there's something higher than yourself you can align with and like put yourself towards that doesn't just get you instant pleasure, instant gratification, material wealth. Right, does that make sense? What he's saying there? I think that's what he means by spiritually developed. I don't think he means people are all like becoming priests because that, that, that didn't happen. 
right? And so he says, like, our characteristics of our life are saddening, as in, like, we have all this great wealth or whatever, but we're kind of, like, moping about, not really caring about it, right? And that's all we care about, he says, or we cared about, right? It was all this, you know, what can I get away with legally and not, like, what should I be doing as a human being to other human beings? All right. A fact which cannot be disputed is the weakening of human beings in the West while the East they're becoming firmer and stronger. 60 years for our people and 30 years for the people of Eastern Europe. During that time, we have been through spiritual training in far advance of Western experience. Life's complexity and moral weight have produced stronger, deeper, and more interesting characters than those generally produced by standard Western well-being. Therefore, if our society were to be transformed into yours, it would mean an improvement in certain aspects, but also a change for the worse on some particularly significant scores. It is true, no doubt, that society cannot remain in the abyss of lawlessness, as the case in our country, but it also cannot, but it also is also demeaning for it to elect such mechanical, legalistic smoothness as you have. After the suffering of many years of violence and oppression, the human soul longs for things higher, warmer, and purer than those offered by today's mass living habits, introduced by the revolting invasion of publicity by TV, stupor, and intolerable music. I don't know why everybody's down against the American music at this point in time. Like Anne Rand's like, everybody listening to music's crazy. You know, the old man is like, get off my lawn with your rap music or whatever. I don't know. I think the music's okay. I think the music's been okay. I mean, like, okay, Vanilla Ice, kind of not cool. Kind of lame, right? Like, but other than that, pretty good. All right. These are meaningful warnings which history gives a threatened or perishing society. Such are, for instance, the decadence of art or lack of great statesmen. There are open and evident warnings, too. The center of your democracy and of your culture is left without electric power for a few hours only, and all of a sudden, crowds of American citizens start looting and creating havoc. The smooth surface film must be very thin, then. The social system quite unstable and unhealthy. So during the 70s, right, there were, because of the electrical grid and, like, the lack of, um, like, fossil fuels to power it, right, in fact, there was this whole deal with OPEC, who's the, uh, like, the um, Arabic nations who controlled the oil supply out of Qatar and Oman and Iran and Saudi Arabia, right? We had a fight with them and so like, okay, no more oil in America. And so like our power grid shut down for a while and like people got really pissed. People wanted to watch their TV and have their AC on, right? And like their radios, their record players, whatever. And so they got pissed and like went on the streets in front of like Capitol buildings started like rioting and trying to burn stuff down. Not like as a result of injustice or whatever, but because their power got off and they were angry about it, Right? So like, so it wasn't a response to any kind of actual threat to them or any actual like injustice that was going on. It was like, okay, we don't have what we you know, should have, and so we're pissed about it. And so he's saying like that's kind of like childish more or less, right? Like as soon as you don't have AC for a couple hours or as soon as you can't you know, watch uh, what was on that point, Flipper or Dragnet or whatever, Dick Van Dyke show, right? Like, as soon as you don't have that on your TV, you're all pissed off and go, right. It's like that's not like moral character that's strong. People in Russia are without food for weeks, right, without power ever. And they don't, you know, riot. So, like, there's, like, a, a weakness or a softness that America or the West, and America especially, is, like, he, he's observed here, right? People get pissed for things maybe they shouldn't be that pissed about. That's what I said. Yeah. All right. But the fight for our planet, physical and spiritual, a fight of cosmic proportions, is not a vague matter of the future. It's already started. The forces of evil have become the offensive, and you can feel their pressure, and yet your screams and publications are full of prescribed smiles and raised glasses. What is the joy about? Basically, he's saying, like, okay, like, Russia's on the move. Communist Russia's already after, like, this point in time, right, Vietnam started up. After Laos and Cambodia and all, like, the East Asian countries, as well as, like, Western Europe. He's like, the Russians, who are lawless and, you know, like, mess everything up, are going to take over places. And y'all are like, raise a glass. Everything's great here, right? Like, cheers. So he's like, y'all need to wake up and see if stuff's actually going on that is important, right? You can't just say things are okay and make them okay, right? All right. This one, I want to read this one. Very well-known representatives. George Keenan is not a very well-known representative anymore. He was, a, he was a politician back in the day, so don't worry about George Keenan. Somebody else want anyone? Would you? I don't even want to, but would you?
Legalistic. Legalistic. Induces, yeah, sorry. Cool, thank you. So what I'm saying here, right, we have, like, the United Nations at this point in time, right, and because the West, like, has become so legalistically bound, right, like, what can we legally do? What can we do and, like, not violate the law? Like, that's what we should care about. We shouldn't care, like, if, so, say, a country gets invaded by communist Russia, right, people are getting massacred in the streets. Like, we shouldn't care about the people necessarily. We should be like, well, do we have a legal right to intervene? Like, can we intervene and not, like, be wrong with the U.N.? Is the U.N. Security Council going to be mad at us? Like, what should we actually do that's, um, like, allowable, right, as opposed to what's actually morally right and wrong? And he's saying, like, communist Russia had a, had a plan and strategy, right, to, like, take over parts of the world through first propaganda, right, and then cutting off economic prosperity in the country and then offering communism as a, as a alternative to that, right? He's like, if we're just sitting back and saying, like, okay, is it right or wrong to intervene, right, and not caring about the people who are being harmed on the ground, right, then we're going to lose that war ultimately. Like, not just the war, like, on the ground with troops fighting, but, like, lose the intellectual, spiritual, and moral war too because we just care about what we're allowed to do. And they're, you know, they have people dressed in street clothes, like, murdering other people in the street in Ukraine, like, as what's called, like, disinformatia, which is, like, a different dis disinformation campaign being, like, oh, these guys on the ground aren't our guys. They're just guys who are pissed off and like us, right? Those aren't Russian, like, you know, special forces out there murdering everybody in the streets. We don't know who they are, right? So there's a whole program that Russia had, like, putting infiltrators within society so they can, like, you know, cause murder and havoc on the streets and then blame the centers within the, own the other country to, like, justify, oh, like, look, look, there's chaos in the streets. Russia's just sending the tanks to protect the people. Yay, Russian tanks going on the street. Now all the people who are like in civilian clothes who are actually special forces in the Russian army are like, yay, Russia, waving flags and like standing on the side corners like kissing babies, right? And so it's kind of the way they rolled into a lot of countries. And he's saying that we're just being idiots by saying like, oh, well, we don't have the right to intervene, right? He's saying we're getting kind of taken advantage of, right? So in spite of the abundance of information or maybe because of it, the West has difficulty saying or difficulties understanding reality such as it is. There have been naive predictions by some American experts who believe that the Anglo, the Angola, rather, sorry, Angola would become the Soviet Union's Vietnam, or that Cu Cubism, or Cuban, I can't read that, that Cuban expeditions in Africa would be best stopped by U.S., by special U.S. courtesy to Cuba. Keenan's advice to his own country to begin unilateral disarmament belongs to the same category. If you only knew, the youngest of the Kremlin officials laughed at your political wizards. As to Fidel Castro, he frankly scorns the United States, sending his troops to distant adventures for his country right next to yours. Right? It's basically at this point in time, everybody's like, oh, don't worry about Castro, he's fine. Like, it's not a big deal. He's just like, Cuba's a small country. And like, Cuba at the same time is invading like West African countries and trying to like topple governments there to like, set up communist regimes there as well and like steal resources, right? And basically you're saying like, oh, yeah, so Keenan was like a political advisor and a uh, senator who was like, hey, we should like just get rid of our nuclear weapons. And then Russia will get, there, get rid of theirs and everybody will be happy, right? He's like, like even like the 18 year old guys who just graduated from high school who are like in the Russian government are like, what an idiot that guy is, right? He's like, y'all think you're so smart, but y'all so dumb, right? right? However, the most cruel mistake occurred with the failure to understand the Vietnam War. Some people sincerely wanted all wars to stop just as soon as possible. Others believed that there should be room for national or communist self-determination in Vietnam or in Cambodia, as we shall see today with particular clarity. But members of the U.S. anti-war movement wound up being involved in the betrayal of Far Eastern nations and the genocide and the suffering today imposed on 30 million people there. Do those convinced pacifists hear the moans coming from there? Do they understand the responsibility today or do they prefer not to hear? Uh, what he's saying here is like, even in places where, like, the Vietnam War is going on, right? Like, okay, we're losing people. People are dying both on the Vietnamese side and American side, right? A lot of lives are lost. He's saying, like, the countries over there who were invaded, like, relied on America or the West in general, right, to protect them from, like, genocide by the communist regimes who then took over. So even though the pacifists, right, are like, we don't want war. We want peace. We hate death. We want life, right? Make love, not war. He's like, that response, right? Maybe it wasn't your life that was lost or your kid's life that was lost, right? But that resulted in the lives of like 30 million other people who you don't know and you'll never meet who, because the communist regimes took over. And then like we talked about like the second day of class, I think, you know, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, right? Like everybody who could read or had an education or wore glasses or was a doctor or whatever, right? They just took them out in the field and shot them dead because they were educated and posed a danger to the new communist rule, right? Like – that could have been prevented hypothetically if we would have cared about like their lives as much as we care about our own lives. So in the moral softening of America and the West, he's saying not only is it like a disinterest for our own like 
discomfort, right? We don't want to be uncomfortable or like give up our Xboxes or our nice cushy lives. We also like don't want to intervene and save the lives of other people around the world because it bothers us, right? We'd rather just say, oh, go get pacifism, and make no war, right? While other people are already engaged in a war and being massacred, right? And because they don't look like us, because they aren't our culture or whatever, right? The West is really the easy time being like, oh no, it'd be terrible to start a war there when like people are already being killed. And so that's his argument, right? That's what he's trying to say. Uh, the American intelligentsia lost its nerve as a consequence thereof. Danger has come much closer to the United States. But there is no awareness of this. Your short-sighted politicians who signed the hasty Vietnam capitulation seemingly gave America a carefree breathing pause. However, a hundredfold Vietnam now looms over you. A small Vietnam had been a warning and an occasion to mobilize the nation's courage. But a full-fledged America suffered a real defeat from a small communist half-country. How can the West hope to stand firm in the future? Right. Basically saying like Vietnam is like the size of New Jersey. And after like 10 years of war, y'all lost that one. Or y'all backed off and said no more war there, right? So what does that show for like any kind of muscle international stage now? Like who now Russia is trying to like rear up, China's trying to rear up. Like, are they gonna want to go against you or are they not? Well, probably because if you lost like I you know it's like you know, Denver Broncos football teams, right? Playing like a junior high school team. And the junior high school time team was like beating their ass at halftime. And the Broncos like, okay, we're just going to leave now. We're not going to play no more. And went home, right? He's saying, well, you know, you think the Raiders are going to, like, take it easy on you next time? Probably not. Anybody Broncos fans? Anybody know? Raiders-Broncos rivalry? It makes sense if you're a football fan. Anyway. All right. Somebody want to read the I have occasion already? You're wild. You're brave. Do it. I think there should be one in there, yeah. yeah. It's weird that the transcription didn't have it. Yeah. So basically saying, right, so what, hap what happened in World War II, right? Like, America went in, right? Who are we allied with? What was the size of World War II? Anybody remember? Or college history five, you're taking, like, history 101 or whatever? World War, remember World War II? The war after World War One, Before World War Z? Right? Mm, Brad Pitt. No. Okay, anyways. Yeah, we we're gonna Germany was on one side. Germany was on one there. Germany on one side, yeah. Who else was on our side? Italy. Italy and Germany were buddies, yeah. World War Two. This is two. Yep, Japan. France was on whose side? France was on our side. We got France, the US, who else we got? Britain. Who else? Well, yeah, Canada. They helped a lot. <laughs> no, Canada helped a lot. Canada like stormed a beach on D-Day too. Keep their stick on the ice, Canada. Um, well, who else was on our side? China, sure. China kind of stayed out of the world, but yeah, China was on our side. China was not with Hitler, and China was getting like massacred hardcore by Japan. So yeah. Poland was in for a second, but like Poland, I mean, so Poland was on our side, but Poland got like overrun by the Nazis real quick. So Poland was, but Poland was on our side. Poland didn't want to be Nazi controlled. No. What about the, so there's one big country we're leaving out, right? The big, the big one with like a sickle and hammer on there, the flag. Whose side were they on? The USSR, yeah. The, they were on our side, right? You'd think that, right? 
That's what he's saying. It's, it's all right. So, no, it's, it's going to be covered, right? Like, it seems like the Russians are the bad guys, right? But that's not the case. What happened was that, so Hitler decided that he was going to invade Russia at the same time as he invaded France and Poland, right? And so Hitler pushed the Russian army all the way to Stalingrad, which is like way the hell north, right? And there's a huge siege of Stalingrad, the movie Enemy at the Gates, it's an early 90s movie, but like, it's about that. The point being is like, we're like, oh crap, like we need an ally on Hitler's other flank. So we allied with Stalin and we're more or less like, you know, like the Russians, communists who've been murdering the Ukrainians for years, like they're not great, but like they're not Hitler. So like, we don't really care what they think or how evil they are. Like we need to beat Hitler, right? And it'd be easier to beat Hitler if we set somebody on his other flank as opposed to like, trying to put American troops all the way through. And what Solzhenitsyn's saying here is like, we, we could have done it ourselves. It would have been more costly, right? Like we could have just brought more American troops and beaten Hitler by, you know, ourselves with Britain and France or whatever, right? But like, we wanted to use Russia as an ally. And that saved us some lives, but it also like gave Russia a huge like boost in their military power as well as their like occupational power because we started giving them weapons and supplies too, right? And so now the Russian troops used to have like one rifle for every 10 people in the army, right? Um, and we're like, okay, y'all stand in line when the guy in front of you dies, grab his rifle, shoot till you die. And the guy said, grab the rifle, right? Like there was literally their battle strategy, but like throw people at it until the rifle gets to some guy, right? And the enemy runs away or freezes to death, right? And so, like, instead of that, all of a sudden, America was dropping the ammunition and stuff. So the war machine turned up. They started taking out the Nazis, and they did a really good job. In fact, they made it to Berlin from the north, right? Fast the Allied troops made it from the south. And so Berlin was controlled by Russia right after the war. And that's why you have the whole idea of, like, the Berlin Wall. You ever hear about the Berlin Wall? So basically, it was, like, the Allies got to Berlin after Russia was already there. And we're like, wait, you can't have control of Germany, too, and Germany's capital. Like, well, that was part of the deal. And Russia was like, fine, we'll divide it in half. And so... Communist Russia had half and like the West had half and people realized real quick the side of communist Russia was really crappy because like people were being starved to death being shot in the basement of buildings for like saying bad crap about Stalin. And so everybody all of a sudden wants to get from the communist side into the, your, the Western side, right? So everybody's running across the checkpoints all day. So Stalin's like, okay, we need a wall. We need a big ass like 15 foot concrete wall with machine gun emplacements and barbed wire. Anybody who tries to cross over is shot. So what's funny is that, well, not funny, not ha-ha funny, right? But what's interesting is that, like, anybody who tried to get over, like, into the communist side, everybody let him in, no problem. There's, like, four people who ever tried that. They didn't have any problem. You try to go over to the Western side from the communist side, their machine guns point out you're going to get gunned down because, like, they didn't want anybody to escape and, like, tell either the horrors that were going on that side or, like, to be able to, like, taste freedom and, like, try to get other people out, right? So they're, like, trying to keep people within their own country was the whole deal in Berlin after that, right? And basically what he's saying is, like, because we allied with Stalin, we're like, okay, Stalin, you're cool. Like, we don't mind you that bad, right? Then that happened. And also in the East, Stalin pushed all the way through China, right, and set up a, a puppet regime in China as well. And so basically because we were like, okay, Stalin, you're better than Hitler, like, we more or less gave a moral sanction or saying it's okay and you have our American endorsement and our weapons and support to do horrible crap because you're not Hitler and you're not Tojo in Japan. Right? So he's saying that that was a stupid mistake because now, like, your enemy is Russia. And there are politi politicians and pol public policy people at the time that he's writing this. They were like, you know what? We should do the same thing with China. <laughs> we should, like, support China against Russia and, like, give them all kinds of weapons and bombs and planes and stuff and be like, fight China, fight Russia. And then if you fight Russia, then maybe you'll both lose and we cannot have our deals with anything anymore, right? It's like, okay, if you do that, then in 10 years, you're going to have China with your own weapons pointed back against you because they don't like you either, right? So, I mean, kind of makes sense, actually, right? So you're saying, like, you Americans need to stop taking, like, the easy way out trying to find people who are both against you to fight against each other while you give one of them arms, right? And the same thing happened in, like, the Iran-Iraq war in the mid-'80s. I don't know if you remember that. Like, there was the, you know, Iraq, Saddam Hussein, right? Woo! Like, we, like, were his best friend. We're like, hey, we don't like the Shah in Iran, so, like, let's give you a bunch of ammunition and weapons of mass destruction, sarin gas and bombs and planes and helicopters. And then, you know, Van Rand and Shah, we don't like you either, but we don't, like, want Saddam to just kick your butt. So let's give you a bunch of weapons, too. So we basically armed both of the countries to the teeth to kill each other, hoping that both of them would lose. And, I mean, they both kind of lost, but, like, they both hated us even more because we were like, okay, like, you just – basically funded a little like it was like a cage match kind of like in ufc or whatever right and like we're just like getting everybody swords and clubs to beat each other with and finally they realized like the only reason we're fighting is because america's giving all this crap to fight with what are we doing and they both just like hate us good job so the point being that he's like that's stupid you stop doing that like you're gonna fight a war fight the war yourself stop trying to like hire mercenaries from other countries that you arm who hate you to then fight you later on right 
I mean, similarly, the same thing happened with Osama bin Laden, right? In the early 2000s or late 90s, right? Like he was trained as an American intelligence operation with the CIA to be a counterinsurgency against the Russians in Afghanistan. So like same thing happened with the Taliban in the, in the 80s in Afghanistan. We're like, hey, here's all these weapons and money. Hey, bin Laden, go lead your people against the Russians. Do we hate the Russians? And well, guess what? Like two decades later, boom. So we don't have a very good track record with picking like good people to support, right? And he kind of sees us coming from before that, right? No. Western thinking has become conservative. The world situation should stay as it was as it is at any cost. There should be no changes. The debilitating dream of a status quo is a symptom of society which has come to the end of its development. But one must be blind in order not to see that oceans no longer belong to the West, while the land under its dom dominion keeps shrinking. The so-called world wars, they were by far not on a world scale, not yet, have meant internal self-destruction of the small progressive West, which was thus prepared for its own which has thus prepared its own end. The next war, which does not have to be an atomic one, in which I do not believe it will be, may be a bury, may be, bleh, may well bury Western civilization forever. Facing such a danger with such splendid historical values in your past, at such a high level of realization of freedom and devotion to freedom, how is it possible to lose to such an extent the will to defend oneself? How has this unfavorable relation of forces come about? How did the West decline from its triumphal march to its present sickness? Have there been fatal turns and losses of direction in this development? It does not seem so. The West kept advancing socially in accordance with its proclaimed intentions, but the, with the help of brilliant technological progress. And all of a sudden, it found itself in the present state of weakness. So basically saying, like, it's not like the West was like, oh, crap, we're developing too much. Like, we need to stop making new TVs that are better. We need to stop researching the radio and tech, like, technology and automobile development. We just, like... We were like progressing really well and doing good and caring about social values. And all of a sudden we were like, just don't care anymore. He's like, how did that happen? That's not usually how it works. Like, like Rome before Rome fell apart, right? Lost a bunch of battles and had like a bunch of countries turn against it. Had some corrupt emperors who were like having like massive orgies in their houses as well. Like other people were destroying cities, right? Like didn't really care about the world, right? Like that, to the best of our knowledge is not going on in America at this point in time, maybe in LA, but that's a different story. Right. All right. So this means that the mistake must be at the root, at the very basis of human thinking in the past centuries. I refer to the prevailing Western view of the world, which was first born during the Renaissance and found its political expression in the period of the Enlightenment. It became the basis for government and social science and could be defined as a rationalistic humanism or humanistic autonomy, the, pro the proclaimed and enforced autonomy of man from any higher force above him. It can also be called anthropocentricity, which meant with man seen as the center of everything that exists. Anybody ever heard of anthropocentric or anthropocentricity before? No? Basically, it's like people is the basis of everything. Like um, the whole like man has dominion over nature. Like go ahead and burn the forest down and like kill all the koalas or whatever if you want to because like people are better, right? So anthro, anthro, right, is like anthropod, like a person, right? Anthropocene is like the human era, right? Anthropomorph. So there's like the idea of an anthropomorphic God, right? Is like a Jesus or a God who looks like us. Right, like God doesn't have like sh like Shiva arms and look like whatever. Right, God looks like a person. That means that's anthropocentric is the that uh, term right there. Right, and so what it means by like rationalistic humanist and, and humanist autonomy is like the idea that we all have individual rights. We can all do whatever we want unless they infringe the rights of somebody else. Right, we have rights, not duties, not obligations. He's saying that there was this basic point he thinks has actually been the undoing of the West in the beginning. He'll go into why. I'm not sure if we, uh, we agree with him or I agree with him entirely, but like this is his argument, right? The turn introduced by the Renaissance evidently was inevitable historically. The Middle Ages had come to a natural end by exhaustion, becoming an intolerable despotic repression of man's physical nature in favor of the spiritual one. Then, however, we turned our backs upon the spirit and embraced all that is material with excessive and unwarranted zeal. This new way of thinking, which had imp imposed on us its guidance, did not admit the existence of intrinsic evil in man, nor did it see any higher task than the attainments of happiness on earth. It based modern Western civilization on the dangerous trend to worship man and his material needs. Everything beyond physical well-being and accumulation of material goods, all other human requirements and characteristics of a subtler and higher nature, were left outside the area of attention of state and social systems, as if human life did not have any superior sense. That provided access for evil, which in now in our days there is a free and constant flow. Merely freedom does not in the not, not in the least solve all the problems of human life, and even if it adds a number of and it even adds a number of new ones. Right. So like, like again, the argument for freedom at the beginning of the essay, right? Like that too much freedom without restriction or any kind of moral guidance, right, can be a problem because people decide they can do crazy stuff. That's bad, right? 
So people decide like, oh, we're going to go bomb in Oklahoma State, like or like Oklahoma State. That's cool. The Oklahoma um, federal building, right? Timothy McVeigh did in like the nineties, right? Because he was pissed off and thought the government was becoming too globalized. He's like, no, man, I'm going to blow this building up, right? Because he wanted to express like the freedom of his like you know political views, right? Or people who feel entitled to do things that hurt other people, like right? who like shoot up schools and stuff because like they want a name for themselves, right? The idea that somehow, like, if you shoot up a school and you're going to get your name put on the news or whatever, it's going to immortalize you in history, right, is a sick concept, right? But why does it happen? Because, like, the media is free to report on whatever it wants to, right? The media can glorify bad people and good people, right? And so he's saying that there's an incentive for some perverse things that arises from the way that we look at things in the West, right? Like, um, I don't know if anybody knows, like, Jeff Bezos, right? The guy runs Amazon. Like, um, my wife's really pissed off because he makes too much money. She's, like, really angry. I'm like, hey. You know, like, yeah, but you get stuff in two days. That's also kind of cool, right? I'm not saying that, like, like he, like, has earned every cent he's made, right? But, like, I guess, like, yesterday, like, just yesterday, he made, like, $10 billion, like, in one day. I'm like, that's pretty crazy, right? But, like, if we look at things and say, okay, that's great. Like, we all want that, right? We want to earn $10 billion in a day and not care about the people who are, like, being the labor put in and their time and whatever in order to make that person that money, right? Like, that's also kind of a messed up way to look at it, he's saying, right? We only care about materialistic success and making the dollar at the end of the day, right? And don't care about other people. Then ultimately you could have horrible things happen like to make a dollar and that'd be just fine. So it's the same kind of idea. I don't know. Does anybody hate Jeff Bezos because he's rich? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Like virtue signaling stuff that's like, oh, look, I wrote a check, like $10 billion check to like save the children or to like, like, you know, ASPCA, like spaying new to your pets, dude. Yeah. Like, it's like, well, that's cool, but like, wasn't that easy? Like you have, you doesn't ha you don't have to care about anything, right? Plus, like it's a tax write off. Like, you're like I'm gonna write this check, so I don't have to pay tax on my money, right? So there's like an, again, like the legalistic system, right? That he's talking about, like, okay, if you make a ton of money, you can like give X amount of money to whatever the hell you want, and then not to pay tax on your other money. So like you come out ahead by giving money to random stuff, right? You don't actually have to care about it, or, like be in, like involved in it, right? So I, I agree, there is a, definitely a lack of um, actually giving a shit about people and things from people who have like tons of money, yeah. Right. We want to like make a difference, like for real. Yeah. Right. Like you don't get anything for it in return, right? Yeah. And like there is this legalistic framework that charitable donations like working, right? That like it's a quid pro quo. You're, you're getting something for something, right? Like I'm donating a charity because it gets me like a tax write off, right? If there was, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of like no skin in the game, actually, right? A lot of times, right? Or like donating to a political cause or whatever. Like, okay, I donated this candidate, so now I don't have to actually worry about like changing things myself. I, my, my good deed is done. I can walk away, right? Oh yeah, like red cross, like. Right. You're not going to go work somewhere for free unless you do it three times. Well, right? Volunteer, yeah. Yeah, like volunteer work, but Well, like everybody's getting a cut too. Yeah, that's true. And like the, even like the, the Wounded Warriors program, which I don't know if you heard about, like disabled vets have been like hurt in combat, right? Like something like 85% of the money goes to pay like the salaries and the overhead of like the two people who started the damn thing. So like people donate like, tons of money to like help Wounded Warriors, right? And like none of it's going to the Wounded Warriors who are wounded. It's one of these two guys who are not veterans who are like totally healthy and have like mansions now. So like that's kind of effed up a little bit, right? I mean, or anything like a Red Cross, right? To not like relief for like Katrina victims and stuff, right? Like eighty five percent of that was to, like the CEO's salary. So I mean, like, so what? 
There you go. Send her a strongly worded letter. Right. Right. That's actually helpful, right? Right. Right. It requires actually taking action, right? No, it's true. But you're exactly right. Like, and I think that's what he's saying is there is a laziness on the part of the West, right? Because of our material success that we're happy to like write a check or like have somebody else deal with that problem, right? Or donate to charity and have the charitable organization take care of it. No matter Because we don't care about how much it helps, right? We care about how much like good conscience we can feel or money we can save or whatever from doing the whole process, right? Not everybody, obviously, but like people who have like money to give and stuff, right? I always think too, like, I mean, I mean, if, you know, if Bezos wanted to do a solid, right? Like everybody got credit card debt, everybody got crappy credit score. I got a crappy credit score, right? Like, if you want to like help people out and like boost the economy, right? Why don't you just like pay off everybody's credit debt? Like he could do that with like one day's earnings, like set it back to zero on their credit debt. Like you realize how many people buy houses like the next day? Like it would be a drop in the bucket to him, right? Or granted, that wouldn't like help the homeless person probably necessarily, but like I mean, maybe his credit score is probably crap too. But like, you know, but people who are like actually middle class and dealing with like credit debt, right? Because it's like a $2,000 credit card you got, you can't pay off because you never got money to pay it off, right? Because you're like paying the interest every month. Like if that was just all of a sudden freed up, like it could improve a lot of people's lives in the middle class, in the lower class, right? And maybe people have more money to donate to like homeless shelters. I mean, you know, it'd be like a, I don't know. You never gonna listen to me. You never gonna do that, right? But like that could be something that's like real, right? I think at least. The same thing too with like, and this is on like the policy levels. We're talking about public policy like next week too, and then the whole class, like the whole healthcare system debate, right? Like, okay, we need like Medicare for all. Like, everybody needs health insurance, right? Like, okay, like is health insurance healthcare? Anybody know? Like, is that the same thing? So, say we give everybody health insurance to Medicare, right? Cool, everybody's got health insurance. Does that give you a doctor? Does that give you an appointment? How long does it? You still got to find a doctor who takes your Medicare insurance, right? And Medicare, like, reimburses at 30 cents to the dollar. So doctors don't want to take Medicare patients because they get paid a third of the amount of money, right? So you give everybody Medicare, right? And everybody has insurance, right? But nobody can actually go to a doctor when they're sick because none of doctors are taking patients and everybody can go so everybody's overbooked, right? It's like, have, it's not health care. Like, the Affordable Care Act, right? Give every, try to give everybody insurance, which... Cool. They didn't give a damn person care, right? It made people care more hard to retain. And so, like, but like, what about the other side? Like, actually affecting things, right? Like, if the government wanted to take all the money it spent from taxpayer money on that and just, like, buy people health insurance who didn't have insurance, like, go to Blue Cross Blue Shield and be like, hey, in the state of Texas, there are, like, 8 million people uninsured. The government's going to literally pay the rate to have them have policies, right, at the normal deal. Then that would be, like, half the cost. Everybody would have insurance and care. Not at a Medicaid rate. Like, it's just ridiculous how much, like, trying to control stuff from, like, a top-down government way just, like, Fs with everything. Like, in my humble opinion. But that's, like, literally what could happen. Like, it would cost, like, a third as much money to give everybody actual coverage that they could go to any doctor they wanted for real. And again, now we're there. <laughs> All right. But again, that's the whole deal about, like, thinking outside the box, right? That would change the way people think about things. So we must talk about that because people, like, the government makes mad money off, like, the insurance companies they say can, like, insure people in the marketplace, right? And then lobbyists and freaking people in K Street, right, in the, in the capital, who, like, lobby for big insurance companies, like, can get a big pay cut, right? Would not fund the senators so they want to win races. Again. It's all, like, this corrupt system, right? And it's all just kind of, like, nobody's actually gives a crap about people, which is what Solzhenitsyn said. Yeah. All right. However, in early democracies, as in the American democracy at the time of its birth, all individual human rights were granted man because God's because he, granted because man is God's creature. That is, freedom was given to the individual conditionally, in the assumption of this constant religious responsibility. Such was the heritage of the preceding thousand years. Two hundred or even fifty years ago, it would have seemed quite impossible in America that an individual could be granted boundless freedom simply for the satisfaction of his instincts or whims. Subsequently, however, all such limitations were discarded everywhere in the West. A total liberation occurred from the moral heritage of Christian centuries with their great reserves of mercy and sacrifice. State systems were, state systems were becoming increasingly and totally materialistic. The West ended up by truly enforcing human rights, sometimes even excessively. But man's sense of responsibility to God and society grew dimmer and dimmer. 
In the past decades, the legalistically selfish aspect of the Western approach and thinking has reached its final dimension, and the world wound up in a harsh spiritual crisis and a political impasse. All the glorified technological achievements of progress, including the conquest of outer space, do not redeem the 20th century's moral poverty, which no one can imagine, even as late as the 19th century. But it's not necessarily like everybody has to be like religious or a priest or Catholic or a monk or anything. He's just saying like people need to have like something higher than themselves to believe in, like a society, a community, like more than just like getting an Xbox and a Rolls Royce, right? Like getting yours doesn't have to be the end of the road. That's what he's saying. Um, should be the goal of a society. And if we have freedoms to just do horrible stuff to each other to get more gold, right? Then society is going to be kind of a bad place. As humanism and its development became more and more materialistic, it made itself increasingly accessible to speculation and manipulation by socialism and then by communism. So that Karl Marx was able to say that communism is naturalized humanism. The statement turned out to be not to be entirely senseless. One does not see the same stones in the foundations of a spiritualized humanism and any type of socialism. Endless materialism, freedom from religion, religious responsibility, which under communist regimes reached a stage of anti-religious dictatorships. Concentration on social structures with a seemingly scientific approach. This is typical of the Enlightenment of the 18th century and Marxism. Not by coincidence, all of communism's meaningless pledges and oaths are about man, with a capital M, and his earthly happiness. At first glance, it seems an ugly parallel. Common traits in the line of thinking and way of life of today's West and today's East, but such is the logic of materialistic development. So we're saying, like, so in communist countries, right, the first thing to do is eliminate religion because, like, you owe your religion to the state first, right, with capitalized. Like, Stalin is your, like, God king, right? You have statues of Stalin, like, with his, you know, fist up in the air, built in front of every building, right? Everything is in Stalin's name. And you eliminate the Pledge of Allegiance. You have the Pledge to Stalin, right? Because, like, he is the manifestation of the state. The state is going to fix all your problems. You owe allegiance to the state first, and then that's it, really, right? And so if you do anything against the state, like take the, some grain and eat it yourself, right? Or do something the government says not to do. Like it's not a crime against like your fellow man. It's a crime against the state. A crime against the state is punishable by death because the state runs everything, right? And the state's is like equation. It's like the algorithm, right? It says like, okay, in order to be happy, people need like this amount of grain and this amount of sunlight and this amount of air and this amount of exercise and this amount of like, labor and they can live on this much money and this much electricity. And so this equation everybody's fit into in like the communist regime, right? And based upon that, if you violate that equation, if you say like, no, I want something, I want to use the bathroom at 1201 instead of 1130, right? Then like that throws it off and you're not being a good cog in the machine. You got to hit the head with a hammer, right? And so that's what he's saying is like, ultimately, like what happens in the West with people using people as means to get wealth, right? Just like, I guess you look at like Jeff Bezos' Amazon workers who are just like, they're like packing packages like ants every day, right? And not making very much money, but enough to survive, right? Like, if that's what the West is doing because it's legally allowed, right, and that's what the communist East is doing because if you don't do that, you're going to get shot in the head, then, like, maybe there are different levels of, like, freedoms that exist, right? But in the actual way it plays out in everyday life, it doesn't look much different, right? And so that's what he's saying here, right? All right. So we have, so we have time. We have, like, a paragraph or two left. We'll not go through. Basically, he just keeps going off the same thing um, about, like, the East being, like, evil and the West being evil too, because we're doing the same kind of thing, right? But under the name of freedom instead of the name of communist dictatorship. So, but I want time to do this in class if there's any questions over we can cover. So we're going to take this and pretend we're writing a final um, or a paper that like, uses all the to speak here, right? As a source. I said it doesn't have to copy necessarily, but we're going to use all the to speak as a piece of evidence for it, right? And so we're going to fill out the editing sheet as if we're quoting the soul of the from a speech as a point of evidence. Because so, like a lot of claims, right? They make it to the speech. So you can only find like one or two, right? And write it off those and record them in the editing sheet. So, first of all, the idea is
So the proposition, which is the next line after the name, right, would be, so in, for example, in your final paper, right, that would be like, I want you, you know, give health insurance to everybody, right? Whatever policy you're going to suggest, actually, if you're kind of perfect for research, right, we'll be able to throw down the evidence sheet for you in the future, right? Right now, this is kind of a mock-up and like a fake thing, right? So we can think of like a policy proposal or a proposition that what Solzhen needs is saying in his essay would support, right? So the proposition could be, I don't know, like, maybe like, Freedom should be less like freedom should be less like um, protected in America, right? Or there should be obligations instead of duties, or like NC seventeen movies should be bad. Like what, whatever you think, like his whole speech he just gave that we went through for three days, right? Whatever you think, something that he would support, right? What do you think? What's something you think he would support? Like brainstorm as a class. Like what's an idea that he would support? Something that's like this should happen or this shouldn't happen. Like, no more tax write-offs. Or like, a mandatory minimum wage, paid sick leave. Like, what do you think something Solzhen needs to support? No more media, right? Like, no, no more cable news networks. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he, like, some, some kind of censorship on, like, media narratives, right? Yeah. Or like maybe getting rid of like the profit incentive for media. I don't know how you do that, but like like all media is now free. <laughs> Can't even pay a subscription to the New York Times anymore. They just give you paper every damn morning whether you want it or not. I'm um, just, just something you think that he would be in support of, right? A proposition that he'd be in support of. So I mean he'd be in support of like, okay, let's like go after the regime in Cambodia, right? Or let's like go after like attack um Laos or, or Pol Pot in Cambodia at that point in time, right? You say that. Or, you know, like, get rid of Castro in Cuba, right? He'd be for probably, right? So if you make something up that he'd be for, you think, right? Because this is just something not... No, that's number one. This is number This is the proposition. So, okay, so the proposition, right, is like... So if, so look at it from Solzhenitsyn's point of view, okay? The proposition is like... What is, he, what is he asking for? Solzhenitsyn was spilling this thing out for his argument, right? Because I'm asking you, like, put yourself in Solzhenitsyn's head for a second. This is the purpose of this exercise, right? So what is Sol something Solzhenitsyn is proposing? Like, what is he saying we should do? What do you think he's saying we should do? Does that make sense? Like, he says a lot of stuff that probably we should do, right? So when he says, like, things that suggest other ideas that he doesn't actually say we should do, it's not uber important. Just like think of something that Solzhenitsyn would say that we should do. Can we do that? Is anybody having a problem? If, it, if that's just confusing as hell to anybody, I can, I can like break it down for them. Because it might be confusing as hell. Like I'm not going to grade the paper and be like, no, Solzhenitsyn wouldn't say that, you idiot. F, no. Like make something impossible. So, something that, something that he would like think would be good. So this is on number one, the proposition, right? Which is like, so for your actual evidence sheet you're doing later in the semester, right? This would be the public policy that you want changed. Like, so like, like, um, like the Department of Education should be abolished. Let's say, if somebody wants to pursue that, right? Because like federalizing education standards needs to standardize testing, which is crap and makes people not actually learn crap in high school, right? Or grade school. Like, hypothetically, that's your public policy, right? Your, pro your proposition, if you're writing that paper, would be, like, the DOE should be abolished because standardized testing makes people not learn anything important, right? So that's what you would put for line one on your final paper of your revenue sheet, right? Does that make sense at all? If we're doing that. But we're not doing that. We're doing souls and decent speech, right? All right. The supporting claim here, right, would be something that specifically supports the proposition you're making. So if you're like, your proposition, somebody give me their proposition they said for souls and needs. I don't care how stupid you think it sounds. Cool. So if that was your proposition, right? That you should filter all stories published by the media, right? To have some kind of diversity or not so much of an echo chamber, right? In the thought that's being put out there. Then what's the supporting claim to back that up, right? So it says a supporting claim should be specifically supported by the data you're citing here, meaning that in the next couple lines, right, you're going to quote from Solzhenitsyn's speech in the next, like, two lines, okay? 
So what's a summary of the claim he's making that you can find close to back up? I don't know if y'all can. I can zoom back in this essay so you can look at it. It's also online. If y'all have devices, you can look at it. If you want to look at the quote, because um, it's pretty long. I want to limit you to like one page. But for example, if we were doing that, right, that uh, media vetting stories, right, we could find a quote up here, right? Something like, like, after suffering many years of violence and oppression, human soul longs for things higher, warmer, and purer than those offered by today's mass living habits, introduced by the revolting invasion of publicity by TV stupid and tall music, right? Like, you could then cite that as your quotation, right? And, like, the reason this is be vetted is due to quality control on, like, media, on TV shows, and on music, right? Because it's somehow hurting the intellectual development and the spiritual goodness of humankind, right? Like, whether or not we agree with that is not really important, right? That's an argument that you could cite that as evidence for, right? So basically what you're doing with the claim is like something that you're saying that you can find an evidence, i.e. a quote in the, in the like, article we're reading to back up, right? So for example, if you're doing like the, the, the educational, the, the policy department education paper, right? You'd like, the claim would be like standardized testing, makes teachers teach the test, it makes it so students don't have time actually learning to read and write, right? Would be your claim. And you'd be reading an article and find a source that says, like, people who have or students who take standardized testing, right? Like, their actual reading score or reading level goes down by however many percentage points for every week they spend on standardized testing. And there's like articles and studies that have proven that, right? So, like, that, that would be like your claim would be like standardized testing makes test scores and education drop. And the source you cite would be the article, right? That's saying studies have shown that to be true. Does that make sense? At all? No? If it doesn't, it's fine. Like, I'm happy to go over it. I'm not trying to just like speak, like moon speak to y'all. I'm having all this like not long. So remember, remember when we talked about, um, before we started doing this essay, right? About the, the anatomy of an argument, right? The claim, the warrant, the analysis, right? The parts of the claim is like what you're saying. The warrant is the evidence that backs it up. And the analysis is how the warrant proves your claim is true, yeah? So basically, the supporting claim here is like, what is one of Solzhenitsyn's claims he makes, right? So one of Solzhenitsyn's claims he makes, right, is, for example, excuse me, <laughs> like the center of democracy and of culture is left without electric power for a few hours. And all of a sudden, crowds of American citizens start looting and creating havoc. The smooth surface of the film must be very thin. So, I mean, I guess the claim here, right? that the smooth surface of the film of, like, our stable society, right, is very thin. And the evidence, the warrant for that, right, is, like, you lose power for two hours, you start rioting. Does that make sense? Like, you're saying, like, the stability in America is not very deep. It's just, like, if we don't have all material comforts, right, we really get pissed off and start doing crazy stuff. The evidence of that is, like, when you lose power for a couple hours, you start looting and rioting, right? So that would be, like, his claim, his claim would be, like, we don't have a very stable society, and the data, right, would be the, like, the fact that when we lose power, we're still losing, right? <laughs> we can deal with some data and more um, later, yes. Let's go with the source, right? So we know we're talking about the source all on the same page there, right? Who's responsible for data? Who's the other person in the group? In this case, right, who's the source? Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Right. You, know, you can look up how to spell it online. Right? It's, it's like impossible to spell. It's right there, though. A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R. There's no E in Alexander in Russian. And then Solzhenitsyn, S-O-L-Z-H-E-N-I-T-S-Y-N. Only one Z in Solzhenitsyn. Sounds like way more than one Z. Right, so he's the source. What's the expertise or the reliability of the source? What would you say? Maybe you're just like to do number six. What, what's his expertise? What's his reliability about what he's talking about? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, right? yeah. Pretty, pretty good sort. Well, I don't know as good as you can get, right? Yeah. He's like what well, you like in the trial, right? He's like an expert witness, right? Like he was like through all the works, like he fought in the Russian military against Germany. He was put in a gulag by Stalin. He escaped Stalin, right? Like 
he knows pretty well what happened over there, right? So that's the expertise, like personal experience, like he's been through the crap and knows what he's talking about somewhat, right? All right, so what organization backs this report? So like, seeing as this isn't like a statistic analysis of like people who have got malaria in like, you know, South Africa last year, right? Like this is not relevant to this, right? This isn't like a UNICEF or UN report or like a Department of Health report on COVID patients, right? So there's no real agency backing this. It's so it's in speech, right? So you can leave that one blank, right? So what the agency is pointing is nothing. But if you do public policy stuff, right? Research that in the semester, you're going to find, like, for example, the Department of Education policy we were talking about briefly, right? Like, there'll be all kinds of stuff from, like, Teachers of America, right? Department of Education and, like, um, uh, like Texas State Department of Education, or, like, Midland Independent School District, right? And so if they're doing a report, like, as an agency, right, you're going to put that here so you know who it is, right? I read some, like, prison populations and, like, over-incarceration for majority, minorities for minor drug offenses, right? Then, like, you, like, have FBI data, right? So, like, the, the agency would be, like, FBI or Department of Justice, right? That was that line's for. All right. The MLA bibliographic entry. Go to, um, to figure that out, right, you would go to the title of the article, right, which is Alexander Solzhenitsyn, A World Split Apart. You would look up on the MLA Purdue OWL site, right, using that data, how to cite this for your bibliographic entry, right? It'd be like Solzhenitsyn, comma, Alexander, comma, A World Split Apart, and then you figure out how to do that. So the homework assignment for next time is to come back with this thing filled out, Okay. So research how to do the MLA bibliographic citation. I said you can pop it in the freaking citation machine if you want. It's not going to be exactly right. So, like, scroll down past the citation machine on the Purdue OWL page, right? And, like, you'll say author's last name, colon, speech, colon, date, whatever, right? And so you can put in the citation machine and start it up and then check back against the rules to make sure it actually does the way it's supposed to do it. That makes sense? I'll show you again, like, um, in case it's in the syllabus too, but the Purdue OWL. D U R D U E O W L. Well, that's interesting. I said, what? Yeah, some going to be left blank because there's no, like, the FBI wasn't, like, forcing him to do that. It wasn't an FBI report. It's just an individual report, right? Or if you're, like, citing a book, right? If you, like, are, are doing a public policy piece and you're citing a book, like, kind of, he see coaches between the world and me or whatever, right? Like, there's no institution that supported that life, so that would be blank on that source, too. All right. All right. And so the in-text citation for number eight, um, the eight B right, so you leave a little heads up, is going to be like Solzhenitsyn, a space, the page number on the speech, right, in parentheses. We'll see how that looks like, right? All, right. All the in-text citations, the author's last name, so Solzhenitsyn, right, page two, because that's what, that's what number eight is going to be the answer to, right, depending on what page the quote is you're citing from. Cool. And so for number, like number freaking two and three, right? Or, yeah, uh, yeah, number two and three, you're going to be quoting from the piece, right? So I'm going to want quotes from the souls and needs in speech for two and three, right? Does that make sense? Cool. And then hopefully down there on the number B under eight, right, will be the page number on which those quotes appear. Make sense? All right, cool. We're good. Y'all can go. Um, I have papers, but I think maybe two or three more.